Hello uh, and welcome to Beecraft Live. Uh, I'm Rodri Powell, the uh, South Wales representative for Beecraft and your host for this evening. Um, and we've got a, a great lineup tonight. We're joined by Wendy and we're joined by Griffith Rees from West Wales, who's uh, a Welsh bee farmer. Uh, and I thought we'd cover the topic of sort of marketing honey and marketing hive products, following on from our uh, last live event where we talked about showing honey to sort of taking it forward a step now and how you actually sell your produce. So starting with you, Wendy, I'm sure everyone knows you as we say all the time, but do you want to give a little uh, little hello? Oh, hello, I'm down in uh, North Devon and I've uh, been a, bee far, a beekeeper for the last eight years or so. Um, had quite a few, but I'm now da down to six colonies so that I can enjoy the bees a little bit more. Um, our, I have to say our bees are, they're doing okay, but there's, we don't have the number of supers on that I keep hearing about elsewhere. And so ours have been quite slow to pick up. There's a fair bit of OSR, but it's distance from the bees. So they're not actually uh, using that to, to fill up the comb. Um, I think most of it, they're, they're storing some nectar away, but uh, thankfully not OSR, because I do not like OSR. But uh, I know a lot of people love it. Um, if if we were putting in foundation for them to build then that would be fine but um yeah so quite a quite slow here at the minute i've actually got a couple of colonies on the odyssey rib myself and it's the opposite they're doing fantastic so i've got about three supers on each hive at the moment and it's pouring in so yeah, yeah there you go the heat's actually brought, I know when we've gone past the oilseed rape fields, that the aromas coming from it now is absolutely fantastic, particularly it has been over the weekend. So I understand the advantages of OSR, but as I say, this year our bees aren't quite close enough anyway to take advantage of them. How about yourself then, Griff? Um, do you want to introduce yourself? Tell yeah, us hello, hello. where you are. And, uh... Yeah, no problem. So I'm Griff Rees. I'm a bee farmer from South Wales. Uh, own a business called Gwyn in Griffith, and we sell award-winning honey. So for the last two years, um, going by the Great Taste Awards, which is the um, the Oscars for fine foods, then we've been the highest rated in Wales for two years running, winning two stars two consecutive years, and we've only entered it for two years as well. So, um, Kamala Jahani definitely tastes really good um, it's not just me saying it and uh, we've built a business around that and um, this year now we've been shortlisted for best Welsh product of the year uh, in the Welsh Food Awards um, we'll find out the results for that now next month and uh, we've also been um, shortlisted for the Dr Emrys Evans Award with the Royal Welsh Agricultural Society and um, we were checked the bees really quick on the weekend, didn't get uh, much time to do what I wanted to do. But um, yeah, everything filled the super last week. Uh, I should have had two on, but uh, I'd only had one on. So this week now, we put supers on again, so number two. And uh, we're not nowhere near three supers full. Like the, like on the oil seed drape, where I am in Kamala, there's no oil seed drape at all. But um, for me, I prefer it like that. Because if you want uh, the best taste in honey, then you want to stay away from oilseed rape. Um, the best taste in honey, if you want to be winning awards, is the wild blossom. It's your clover, it's your bramble, it's the hawthorn, it's the dandelion. That's what the chefs like, and that's what the uh, the fruit food critics and judges like in taste. Um, oilseed rape's very strong. It's a particular taste. And with any kind of um, mono farming or mono crop, um, just one variety of taste. Um, you know, we're not, we're not used to that in Britain. Um, on the continental in Europe, uh, you've got much bigger farming, much bigger fields. And um, especially in somewhere like France, you, you can get uh, sunflower honey, oilseed well, drape honey, uh, peas honey, uh, even oak honey, um, they've got vast areas of oak, which um, you can get specific types of honey in Britain, uh, unless we're talking oilseed drape or maybe some peas, maybe some other crops. Um, very unlikely you're going to be able to narrow that down to a specific crop. 
but um, we found that a mix floral variety works really well. No, oh, brilliant. So how many colonies do you run then? And so we we try to run roughly around the seventy mark. Um, coming out of winter, we're always uh, below seventy, so we're probably at the minute high fifties, low sixties. Um, give that probably four weeks to five weeks between some splits. We'll probably be back up to around about seventy mark there, and um, hopefully go over the seventy mark um, into the eighty plus this year. Um, there's definitely demand for the honey. Um, most years we can't produce enough to the suppliers we've got. Uh, coming off the back of a fantastic year last year, we've got uh, some more honey this year. And uh, we're in negotiations with a few different places now on um, stocking them with uh, our honey. Oh, that's lovely. It's nice to see Welsh honey being promoted so well. Uh, <laughs> well it is. I'm not biased there, but yes. Not that you're biased. <laughs> no, not at all. Oh, yeah, because what, what people uh, don't forget, and when, when we talk about marketing honey, what's really important is in Britain, I think it's been estimated that we can only produce between 10 and 20% of honey consumed in the UK. Mm. So when you think of that, 20%, well, that's not a lot. You know, that's a premium product for the British people. Mm. Otherwise, you, you know, you have to buy that imported blended stuff, which I don't rate at all. You know, I wouldn't even class that stuff as honey really you know it says from eu and non-eu countries i mean in this country by law we've got to have a country of origin on it how are those uh, packages and producers getting away with not stating the country of origin on a jar is beyond me and um there's a few reasons they, they, they might want to be doing that but um when we're talking about british honey let's call it 20 percent. that's all we can produce so there's a premium market there for that honey now, if you want to narrow that down, say I'll, I'll use Wales as an example, maybe only 5 or 6% of that 20% is Welsh honey. And that could be the same for specifically for English honey or Scottish honey. So straight away then, you take in a premium product, which is very, very low in quantity, then bringing that number down to a lower quantity again. Now, that's fantastic when it comes to selling because supply and demand uh, determines the price of things and with an island there's only so many fields so many flowers there is physically only so much honey we can produce now if you can successfully build an audience and a market for your honey you will sell it no problem uh, for example you know i've gone one step more specific again my honey is called Venture honey so all my bees live in one county that honey is specific to an area and people tend to like that so say if i go if i go to england and go say i go to somerset or uh, any, anywhere in england then i would want to try and taste the honey from that area to see the taste difference and it's the same if you go to france i want to eat french honey if i went to spain i want to eat spanish honey so that's the key marketing factor there is narrowing down your target market and producing a product that that market wants because there's no point us selling um you know just blending honey up with everything and then selling that as blended honey you've just reduced the price of your honey and in the uk you know food you know, food costs are quite high labor is quite high we import a lot of beekeeping equipment jars lids etc well, we've got a lot higher costs, so we need that little bit extra for the products we produce, you know. So um, that's a little bit of my business model and um, the way we market honey. And um, so far, so good. It's worked okay, you know. And uh, but you've got to have the quality, and you've got to have the story, and you've got to you've got to be able to prove what you're saying is what you're selling. So we're very transparent uh, on in Gwyn and Griff. We put a lot of things on social media, a lot of things on YouTube. Uh, we get a lot of TV, media, radio companies coming here to the farm, filming the bees, take them to the honey house, show everybody everything uh, very, very transparent so there's no um, question mark on uh, oh, oh, on, your, on the truth that you're trying to say. Mm. You know, um, they can come here and see what I'm actually talking about and that works well because more now than any time before people want to know where the food are coming from and um, people are willing to pay a bit more for that 
and people are still really interested in bees and beekeeping so it's as you said getting the media involved as well it's helping your biz grow your business and raising awareness as well isn't it so it is and the, the media are helping beekeepers out more than they know you put the news on bees are on the news pretty much all the time you know bees are in decline and uh, i know some people would argue the fact that they're, they're not uh, but the truth is they are you know we've lost massive amount of bee forage uh, you know due to monocrop uh, industry building houses draining fields etc building roads infrastructure all that has reduced the flowers and, and the feed for bees um varora mites that's been pretty much the, the the major factor in honeybee losses um you're talking you know some people are saying and i think it's true that we've reached a stage now in the uk unfortunately that the honeybee can't live without the beekeeper anymore um and that's just due down to varora and i know some people would argue the fact on that whether that's true or not um but you don't see you you tried don't treat your bees you go back next year and you'll see the mites on them they're, they're nowhere near as good as what they were the year before um and i know treating them then that that opens up a can of worms you know because if we if we're treating them all the time then evolution can't take its toll to build up a beer uh, a varora resistant bee etc but it's the same with any livestock a honeybee is a livestock um with sheep and cattle you worm them because you don't want them to go ill and die from worms um and it's the same with with honeybees you know they're livestock we're supposed to care for them they're our livestock and um that's just part of the parcel really when it comes to bee farming and just beekeeping in general mm. Yeah. Oh, lovely. Well, should we uh, delve into some questions because they, they, they're coming in thick and fast at the moment? Yeah. So. Right. So, um, first one everyone says you can't make a fortune from beekeeping uh, and there's no profit to be made in the selling of honey. How do you make beekeeping profitable? Right, well, there, there is. You farm it to answer this. <laughs> there, uh, do, do you mean to answer this, Audrey? Yeah, go on, fire away. Right. So there is a bit of truth in that. Um, I'm not 100% uh, full-time bee farmer. Uh, my income comes from various sources. I work part-time. I'm a bee farmer. I've got a small farm as well. So my income is varied. And um, the problem we've got, there's, there's bee farmers in the UK and they are full-time bee farmers and they are making a living and a decent living at that through the bees. So... Uh, to answer that question simply, yes, you can live off the bees and you can live off it full time. No problem. There's plenty of people doing that. But there's not a great deal of people doing that. And um, mm -hmm. if you compare Britain to the continent, to Europe, say France, Spain, Italy, they get much, much better weather and the weather is more guaranteed every year. So within your business, you can analyze or predict for next year roughly what your honey crop's going to be because you're pretty much guaranteed uh, you know, so many amount of days of good heat or dry weather that the bees are guaranteed to produce the honey crop for you. In the UK, um, it's not like that at all. Last year, if we, every year was like last year, there'd be a lot more bee farmers. Uh, but the year before that, that was a terrible year. Um, you know, we were just pretty much covering costs, you know, even on my type of scale, you know, my feed bill is within the thousands. You go to a bee operation, which has got over 500 hives, is, you know, just his feed bill is going to be in the tens of thousands. Add labor on top of that, insurance, vehicles, etc. You know, there's a lot of cost to bee farming that people are unaware of. Well, even, you know, hobbyist beekeepers would be aware of how expensive it is just to, to keep bees on a small scale, you know, if you were just to start off beekeeping, now I put a, a, a YouTube video out on this a few months ago, it's going to be roughly a thousand pound to set up just to have one hive and all the equipment easy. Now, that's how expensive it is. Now, you times that by 70 or times that by 500, you're talking a major, major investment, you know, and um, that's, that's the biggest problem when it comes to making money off the bees. Uh, once you're on my scale, you've got to have um, a honey a purpose built honey house, ex you know, commercial extracting facility, you've got to have the food hygiene, animal health, they've got to sign you off. 
there's a there's a lot of regulations that we've got to comply with. All that cost money to be compliant, and um, as long as we get a good year, it can be very profitable. Uh, no ifs or buts about it. You know, honey's a premium product. Uh, pound for pound, it's worth a lot more than most food products out there. Um, the biggest problem we've got is the weather. We we just can't guarantee what the crop next year is going to be, and it's it's very hard then to invest in your business too low for the growth next year because yeah. you could invest this year ready for some growth next year, get hit by bad weather, and you've made a loss. And um, two or three years running like that, and a lot of beef farmers that 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 would be enough to bankrupt them. And um, that that's that's the that's the, the biggest problem. But but the trick is. People have got to market their honey correctly. They've got to add the value to the honey. And, you know, British honey, we're only producing 20% of it in the UK. And that's just what we consume in the UK. For example, if another country wanted to buy UK honey, well, that, that's even uh, more of a premium product because it's that rare that we, have, we haven't got enough to export on a huge scale. So... As long as we market the honey correctly and people go behind it and um, you know refuse to buy all that globally blended stuff and uh, prefer to buy uh, decent British honey, then that's going to increase the price of it. It's going to increase the demand of it, and it's going to help bee farming and beekeeping in general. This um, marketing of it is, is so important. I mean, a lot of bee farmers actually make a lot of money more i think uh, perhaps uh, out of queen rearing and packets and selling selling on bees and selling nukes of bees than necessarily they do from their honey and i think that's a, a a balance that bee farmers have to try and work out for themselves as to what their main the main thrust of their business is going to be i mean obviously you you know, want to do a bit of everything because you want to replace your own queens um but uh, you know, I think that that's it's getting the balance of knowing what you want to achieve and how you want to achieve it. And that's true, what yeah. Balance is. It's where this diversification, isn't it? Um, I, I know Griff, yeah. you you do you've got other streams as well, haven't you? Like sort of equipment and that type of thing as well. So. It, yeah, and um, we we uh, manufacture a, a bee carrier, a tool person bee carrier. That's that's not a, a massive seller. But to supplement the bee business then, we sell uh, bee feed as well in the winter. That helps to create an income for the bee farm. Obviously, we buy so much feed in bulk, then we can pass that saving on to smaller beekeepers that can't get the bulk price. And we sell it online then for people who want the convenience of just buying one pack and getting that delivered to the door just to feed one nuke. Um, we, we do that as part of the business as well because... Um, in this day and age, whether it's bee farming, farming, or any industry, diversification now is more important than any time before. Uh, long gone the days of uh, people getting a job for life. Uh, you know, there's cutbacks, people losing work, um, people losing yeah. contracts. Um, it's, it's very, very good advice in whatever that you do in, in life to diversify so you're not relying on one source of income. Because once you're on that one source of income, all your eggs are in one basket, uh, one major downfall um, can have a devastating effect on your business or your life. Um, the way I run my bee business, my fa the, the farm is incorporated into the business. So if the bees will do really bad one year, hopefully lamb will do quite well or the beef will do quite well. And um, it just helps each other out. Last year, the, the, the bees did very well, uh, and the lambs did very well at the start, but then the price dropped. So we, we were lucky for the, the extra crop of honey. It just makes the farm profitable then. Uh, does does help out a lot. Oh, lovely. I suppose you touched upon it earlier then about creating a brand and marketing the honey, and that sort of ties into a question. Um, how do you create a brand for selling a honey and hive product and how do you market those products you know what sort of marketing options are available to you yeah well the, the big thing at the minute people like uh, to know that the founder or the owner of a business and they will support the business based on that so you've got tesla with elon musk you had um apple with steve jobs microsoft with bill gates we live in a time now where 
these founders are just as important as the business that they've created. Now, which what you stand for with Winning Griff, what we stand for is honeybee health, honeybee welfare, and premium and top quality taste in honey. And we're very, very transparent uh, with how we market that. And um, the, the best thing you can do, if, if you're trying to go in a honey and say you're buying cheap imported honey, and then you're trying to brand that as UK honey, you're going to be found out really, really easy. You know, people are going to, not going to see you. Uh, driving around the countryside with a pickup full of supers, tending to the bees, um, you know, wherever you live, you're going to be quite well known because there's not many bee farmers w- within the UK. So if you're a bee farmer in a particular area, pretty much everybody in the village is going to know you as the bee guy. Um, you know, if, if, if you're up to uh, you know some rogue activities, you're going to fuck get found out there. So the best thing that you can do is to be 100% authentic, be 100% genuine, create a good personal brand that your face and your brand and your reputation is behind your honey. And that, that's, that can be stronger than any, um, you know, a fake brand name that's out there. You know, you, you compare yourself to massive corporations like Coca-Cola, you know, they're doing really well at the minute, but you follow that story right back. That was one guy in a pharmacy that invented Coca-Cola and such a side selling it. And, the, the story is from that one guy and that massive corporation has come from the back end of it. And pe- people like to, to support micro businesses. You know, we've seen that now in the brewing industry, microbrewery uh, is popping up everywhere and people would rather buy a can of good beer or lager from a microbrewery you now than go to these massive corporations that have been selling on the market for years and years because people want to know the story behind your product. And they want to see that way of life. So with this, you know, with the social media, it's never been easier to do that. You know, you can be on the bees, you can take photos, you can do videos, talk people through, you know, what is what's it like bee farming? What are you doing there at the minute? Go back 15 years ago. That's all you had was photos that you could put on the jar, and people just have to assume that you were genuine and what you were selling was your honey. Now it's so easy to sh- to show people you are actually beekeeper, you're actually bee farmer. This is the honey we're producing. When I'm extracting in the honey house, I, I put videos out, photos out. It's all part of the branding. It's all part of saying the story and for people to know. And if, if you're like me, when I buy something, I want to buy the best that's out there. So I'll do my research and I'll find that. Well, with beekeeping, as long as you're buying British honey from a beekeeper, it doesn't matter how big or small he is, he is going to have a, a premium quality product that people need to buy and you need to promote it as such. Mm, yeah, yeah. And I, as you said, that applies to the, even the, the small hobbyist scale beekeepers as well. Is, yeah. So my beekeeper mentor, he, he's got his own sort of unique brand where he sells honey through car boot sales and, and places like that. And people know him and they go specifically to him to get his honey. That's yeah. it. Then. Once you get the customers on board and they taste your honey and they know you're authentic, they will be your customer for life. Um, we just recently started selling on Amazon and um, we're getting return customers off that uh, shopping platform. And um, just because people know it's the real stuff, uh, we don't buy any honey in. And uh, <clears throat> they've just got the proof and the guarantee there of what they're actually buying is what they think they're buying. Mm. Yeah. I think we, we said it a few events ago, you know, beekeeping in Britain is very traditional, isn't it? You know, you've got your typical market stall selling honey. Um, and that's changing now. You mentioned Amazon there and other platforms. Um, so, you know, it's becoming more global, more electronic in in this ways of selling the products. So. It is. It's, and it's a customer too. It's, we live in an age now where it's never been easier to spread your message or your story. But at the, at the flip side, then it's never been harder to get people's attention because there's so much information being flooded out there every day. You go on Facebook and you, you scroll in, people are just selling, 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 and you become immune to that and you black blanket out. So you've got to create a product and a brand that does stick out uh, to stop the scroll for them to look at what you're selling, what you're doing. And, and the way you do that is you start small, you start local. Um, you know, I've been uh, 
beekeeping now for almost 10 years and it's only last year people have really started to hear about me and you know they go where, where where's this great feast guy coming from he's winning these awards well i was keeping bees 10 years ago and no, no one knew about me back then you know um anything in life is it's a long process uh you know you see these success stories online you know he's got this guy made a million pound in one week or whatever you know that's that's not the truth um the struggle is long and hard and it, you you've got to stick to it and um Sometimes for your deckers and deckers and deckers, as long as you are being authentic and you're selling a good product and you believe in what you're doing and you're passionate about it, um, that's going to translate and that's going to come through to other people and it, they are going to be able to see it. Oh, lovely. So, so with you, sorry, go on, Wendy. I was just going to say it's it's actually a case of selling yourself. Um, it's you know you have to sell yourself first before you can sell your product. It you is, yeah, that, yeah. That trust and uh, the you have to build that relationship with the person that's buying, um, and as an individual, uh, and the only way to do that is a, is to get out there locally to actually meet people and and promote yourself that way, uh, and gradually it does build, doesn't it? It does, yeah. And word of mouth is massive. You know, yeah. people, people tend to just focus now on social media. Uh, you know, by advertising, just push that out. But word of mouth is far more um, effective because mm -hmm. when you tell someone that you know, oh, I bought this honey and it's the nicest tasting honey that I've ever tasted, and I've looked, I've looked this company up on Facebook or Twitter, Instagram, and uh, you know, they're educating people, they're showing people where the honey comes from, how it's made, what kind of flowers it's come from. P people like to know that in-depth yes. information especially if they're interested in the product um you know you see that with cars you know people want to know what country is made from what's the technology behind it because you go back 10 years ago people would sell you a brand new car and they wouldn't talk about the technology the gearbox the engine nothing no they are bragging about the technologies in the gearbox what kind of chip what kind of electronics are in there people want to know the fine detail and that's the same with food mm. yeah because the problem we've got for years, we've been flooded with uh, cheap products, fake Second. products, um, you know, stuff that's not up to standard. Uh, someone puts a fancy uh, badge and labeling on it and they sell that as quality. But then you actually look at the label and the company behind that brand or behind that honey or product, which, whatever you're buying. And then you look into it, or, well, that's just bulk that someone's just put a badge on it and they're charging double the price for it when you know and, and you see that um, i think it happened to hula hoops i think all these um were bagging hula hoops for hula hoops and um aldi sold a bag the outside bag was aldi hula hoops but they opened the bag up and it was it was hula hoops branded small bags in the bag <laughs> so they got caught out well if you're buying hula hoops for double the price of aldi hula hoops you expect to have double the quality and double the well, whether the ingredients are better or something needs to be better there for that to be worth double the price mm. well we live in an age now where these massive supermarkets they're selling stuff for double the price they're putting a fancy label on it but it's not double the quality you know you've got to go direct to the source someone like me or another beekeeper doesn't matter how big or small they are well they are the source that is the source of the best honey in the uk is when you buy it from the beekeeper himself mm. No, oh, lovely. So, with with your brand, then, so take like a jar of honey. How, how did you create your your label? How did you create that brand? What was the thought behind that? I know I've recently commissioned some labels to be done, and it's got to be one of the hardest things ever. It's to get in a label you're happy with to make it stand out. It is, and what's what's more important as well is is colour. Um, if we go in the supermarket now. A lot of the finer foods they tend to label stuff black mm. um where I, I didn't want to compete with the same color as everybody else so i wanted to go with the yellow um and the light orange because that's the color of the honeybee that's the color of the beeswax that's the color of the honeybee and i wanted to stay true uh to that form so we we st didn't get tempted by going black um market research now says that white is the new black 
So if you want your labels to stand out now, they say to use what go with white. And uh, again, we've seen that in the car industry. Go back 10 years ago, you know, you were a big baller, a big player. If you had a black car, black BMW, <laughs> now everybody wants a white BMW. And um, that's just trends and what people look for when they're shopping and um, uh, white, they think no. So if, if you're in the process of creating new labels for your honey, go with white because that's what everybody is saying to go with at the minute. I'm glad I got a little bit of white in mine now. I? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah. that, that, that's where I learned that. Um, I'm on um, a cluster group, a government cluster group in Wales, and we went to Cardiff University to zero to 40, I think it was called. And they've got a, um, it's almost like a laboratory, really, where they get students to come in and people to come in, and they've got like an artificial shop with cameras everywhere. And they, they specifically look at people's eyes so they know where they look at first, and they uh, experiment with different colors, different branding packaging labeling etc and uh, the guy there told me that um white they were getting a lot more hits with white and uh he was saying white white is definitely going to be the new black uh, moving forward oh, that's that's interesting that's, and there's yeah, well, yeah, they're really standing out for their white top actually yeah. yeah well my my labels are white as well oh not fair <laughs> head, head, head of the game yeah yeah oh, there you go <laughs> Does, it, does that change then? I wonder. You know, because you said black, it used to be black; it's now white. Yeah. And yeah. you know, will that change going forward? Yeah. I think I think it will. Um, I'm definitely noticing a lot more white uh, going into the shops, and it's it's like, it's like one of those things. Say you just bought a red car. Say you bought a red Toyota. Next week on the motorway, three lanes down the side of the road, you notice that red Toyota coming down the road. Well, that car was always there before, but know that that's important to you you tend to notice it more yes and mm. the same with uh you know when you're looking for specific things within the honey uh, or coloring the labels you you see it straight almost subconsciously and um you know it's annoying really once you learn something you go somewhere and you, you can't help it but you you see <laughs> what other companies are doing and um that's that's another great thing a great tip for the for the smaller beekeeper if you if you want to you know get branding done better Go to your supermarkets and just look at all the stuff that's there. You've got companies there, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Kellogg's. These guys spend millions and millions and millions of pounds on branding to get you to pick their product in the shop because the competition there is immense. You can learn so much just by analysing what they're selling on the shelves and incorporate a little bit of that into your own labels to get that to stand out without spending the millions and millions of pounds that... Uh, they spend to get uh, you to buy their stuff. Mm -hmm. You said earlier you do. Uh, you've got you know the awards for the UK good food and things like that. Is it important to have awards to help make your products stand out? You know, yeah. even like a hobby scale. You know, if people start showing honey and they're winning prizes, they, I suppose they could use that as a a selling point, couldn't they? It is, yeah. And um, you know, British honey is worth a premium anyway, especially in Britain. But if you want to get a little bit extra for it, then you've got to get the awards. You've got to get um, someone else to back your honey up. It's, you know, just you saying that it's the best is, is, isn't going to stick it, really. You've, you've got to have proof uh, people are looking for that. And by winning something like the Great Taste Awards, where you know that's pretty much the highest food award uh, that you can win, by getting on the platform there, getting on the pedestal, and um, that being showcased at that level, that allows you just to get a little bit extra for your honey because what you're selling is a little bit special. Um, you know, the judges there, the the the, the best food critics out there, um, very, very professional people, and they, they know what tastes really good and they're after a particular taste. Um, and it, it adds trust to the brand, you know, when you get a, a great taste sticker on your label or any kind of recognised authority sticker on your label, people are going to trust that straight away because a big company or a big organization has already done their due diligence on that brand. So if, if you were selling something which isn't of standard, they wouldn't endorse it or award you with anything. Mm. It's just a, a great way of getting um, more authority and more confidence 
and uh, just getting people to trust your brand, especially if if you if you're a new beekeeper, you're not watching this. Uh, you want to build up your honey brand. Um, it's just a great way of getting people to believe in you, believe in the product. Uh, winning awards does does that massively for you. Oh, lovely. And well, a question has just come in. It's slightly off topic, but it's quite interesting. Um, it's from Richie from Pant Derwin Apiaries. Um, and he's asked, if you have numerous apiaries, do you mix the honey from each of the sites? Uh, we have noted a difference in taste on the honeys from various sites, despite being a few miles apart. I suppose it, if you've got multiple apiaries and you extract from those apiaries, then you could use that as a selling point, I suppose, couldn't you? The different tastes in the regions. You could. Um, that would be a lot harder. To, we don't do that. What we sell is, is Kamar, then Shahani. Now, we're lucky there's no crops in Carmarthenshire, so it's very unlikely the honey from, say, my home farm is going to taste different to honey which is 20 miles away or 30 miles away. As long as it's within the county, uh, say, compared to now, dandelion and the blackthorn are in flower in Drisloin, the dandelion and the, the same kind of flowers are going to be in flower in Kungwili, for example. So... The honey is going to be very, very, very close um, to taste and texture wise, as long as you're within the same county. The only time it could be very different, um, say 10 miles away, you've gone from an upland area down to a lowland area where the flora and the fauna is slightly different, or there's more dandelion or more blackthorn, etc., in one area to where another site is. The honey can vary there, but. Um, it's that wildflower mix. That's the best taste in honey. And as, lo as long as your apiaries are not too far away, they're within one county. The only um, thing that I see the big difference is there is a difference between spring honey and summer honey. Um, there is a bit of variation there. Um, but as long as you haven't got oil seed drape or a, a monocrop um, coming in, uh, that's going to drastically change the taste of the honey. And... Um, I, I found out that's, 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 that's the best mix, really, because if you're trying to sell, unless you're going to sell super, super local, say I've got a Tandelo honey and a Camarthen honey, then the Camarthen honey will sell really well in Camarthen, and the Tandelo honey will sell really well in Tandelo. But the mm. Tandelo honey won't sell in Camarthen, where the Camarthenshire brand sells across Camarthenshire really well, and it sells well outside the county because people want to know, well, this commercial honey is winning all these awards. I, w I want to taste that honey to see what it tastes like. And it, my honey would taste different to maybe an apiary in England where, you know, there are a few weeks ahead of us, different crops. Maybe they haven't got as much trees, as much blackthorn, as much um, uh, the trees, chestnut, etc. where, you know, maybe over there it's all bramble, all clover, where in Wales, especially commercial we got a really mixed uh, wild habitat, a lot of hills, and that's that's the best places to make honey. Really, as long as a tractor can't get there, that land's going to produce good honey. You know, because <laughs> um, once a tractor goes on it, he plows that fields up. You know, most if he's a big dairy farmer, um, really, there's not going to be any clover in there. It's just going to be rye grass. Yeah. So that massive field then is just a desert for the honeybee, really where in Camarthenshire, and I think a lot of parts in Wales, uh, we're on a lot of old lays, um, especially the beef and the, and the sheep farmers, they don't tend to plow and seed dry grass. Um, it's predominantly the dairy guys that do that because they've got to have the high protein f to, to produce milk. And um, another benefit we've got in Wales, uh, especially Camarthenshire, we've got really small fields, where that's, that's the biggest difference between Wales and England, really, especially Camarthenshire. When I go to England, I can't believe the size of fields. You know, you can literally fit my whole farm in one corner of one field there. Where in Camarthenshire, we've got lots of small fields, so that means there's lots more hedgerows. Absolutely. And knows that, that's, that's where the honey comes from. Mm. You are very lucky in that. Very lucky. Yeah, and, um, you know, we, we've used that in our branding um, for beekeepers. What I'm saying now, everybody's nodding. Everybody knows the information I'm saying, but not everybody is saying it. You know, if you you can tell someone, well, you know, it might not live in the best area, but it's really wild, it's really rough. Um, there's great flowers living there and growing there, and it's great habitat for the bees, and we produce great honey off of that, where 
you know, you could someone else could just look at that and go, oh, look at the whole mess over there. That that's that's rubbish. But you look closely and specifically at the different types of flowers that's there. That could be a fantastic place to produce honey. Mm. Mm. I was just thinking of some of the local shows I've done with my association, and you know, you're selling honey with different people attending. And you could have sort of 30 different varieties of honey from different areas and yeah. how confusing that can be to the public as well um i suppose you know can you have t too much of a range of different types of honey you probably can't not um not not in this country anyway because we, we produce so little of what we actually consume um a real key in honey um uh, advocate or a uh, honey addict then he would love to go out there and taste the different types of honey so say mm -hmm. you, you live in an area where there's lots of lime uh, depending on the time of year you put an empty super on and you know that honey is lime you can put that aside and then you can um, prove that's lime by the way it looks and how clear it is um, that could be an extra premium product because going back back by the facts that I said Say we say 20% of the honey we produce in the UK is all we consume in the UK. If you narrow that down to how much of that actually then is just lime, well, that could be 2% or 1% if, if you narrow that down. So as long as someone wants that specific type of honey and you can market that well and you can push the reasons why someone wants to buy that, then there's no reason for that not to sell at a premium. And what I would do, if you, if you live in an area... Uh, where you've got specific types of honey, maybe you could do a box up with smaller jars and label it as such. So you could have your spring, you can have your lime, you can have oil, she drape in it and create that different variety. I know in Europe they do this quite well because of all the crops that they've got, they've got there in the vast area that they can move their bees. Um, when I went up to France, um, I went to see a bee farmer out there, he had an open day, and I think I tasted something like, I don't know, 15 different varieties of honey that he'd grew just within his area of France just because of how big and wild the nature and the countryside is there. You know, you compare France to the UK with the same population, but France is three or four times the size of the UK, so they've got that much more wildlife, that much more flora and fauna that they've got different varieties of honey from. Unfortunately, we haven't got the same variety in the UK. Uh, normally, it is just spring and summer, or it's going to be like a, what I'm selling uh, like a commander's area, you know, a county um, honey then. Mm. I suppose you got one or two specifics, maybe like oilseed rape. Heather honey is a big one. That's, that's... Yeah, that, that, that's, that is the premium product in, in the UK. Mm. Do, do you have much heather by you, Wendy? No, well, there's, there's heather on Exmoor. Um, we did have some colonies down on Dartmoor. But to be honest, the uh, there's very little heather down on Dartmoor, not worth it at all. But I think, yes, you can get some up on Exmoor. Um, I know a bee farmer that um, that has a line up there each year. But um, personally, I don't like heather honey. I find it much too strong. I've got, funny enough, I've got some in a jar um, downstairs, and it's almost black. Uh, mm. It tastes quite like black treacle um so for me that's not um that's not what i like i like the the floral um oh, i love it nice. <laughs> sorry you i love heather honey i think i'm the honey addict so oh well in that case next time i see you rod i shall bring that jar of he heather oh. honey to you because you're welcome to it, <laughs> oh, it. so uh have you, have you got any advice griff for potential bee farmers or hobby beekeepers who are looking to sell a surplus of honey what what top tips would you offer them my top tip is get everything sorted so if you're going to sell in the shops you know food hygiene regulation that that kind of um, regulations is going to be in front of you don't be put off by that because that's really really easy to get um, honey is a very low risk food so as long as you're clean um your kitchen is not dirty uh you can prove um the cleanliness levels um as long as you're on a small scale i think food hygiene will pass uh, pass a kitchen for you if you're small scale um get that sorted early so you don't have to worry about it because when, once you're in the shops uh trading standards sooner or later will come knocking on your door and 
as long as you've nipped that in the bud before you get started, you don't have to worry about that, and you can really, really push your honey. Because once you know everything's legal, everything's legit, you can really push your honey. You can get us, you know, as a, as a minimum, no matter how small of a beekeeper you are, set up a Facebook page, set up an Instagram page, set up a YouTube page, start building an audience, even if it's a small local audience. So when you go to the market or you sell in the shops, people only buy stuff if they know of you. So let's put that in perspective. If I'm going to a shop and I want to buy a drink, you know, I'm thinking I'm thirsty, I'm going to buy Coke. I'm going to buy Coca-Cola because I know Coca-Cola. I know what that tastes like. I know the brand. If I go to a shop and I see some cola, a make that I don't know of, I've never heard of them, I'm not really going to go for that because they think, um, a marketing thing I watched the other day, they reckon you've got to come, someone's got to come across you at least three times before they're going to do business with you. Um, so the more you're on social media, the more you're pushing your brand, uh, the easier it is it is for you to going to be able to sell your stuff. And where this, if that's just a hundred followers that you've got just around your, around your village, around your town, um, spread the story, show people how you keep bees, do that as a bare minimum. So people know you're authentic, they know you're legitimate, and then people would be uh, more confident to buy your honey. And um, the trick is don't sell it too cheap. Um, it is it is a premium product. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, don't don't sell yourself short because by the time, you, especially if you're small scale, you can only buy jars in a small amount of number. You can't buy the pallet price like me. Same with labels. You know, you're not going to buy a thousand plus labels in one go. So your costs are going to be that much higher as a hobbyist um you know make, make sure make sure you're selling it for a, for a decent product and you know have the passion in it and honey you set up beekeeping is unlike any other hobby really it can cost you a thousand pound to set up just by buying the equipment at one hive but you know what that will pay itself off in the end you know within just within honey and the more the more bees you get hopefully the, the better summers you get the more money you make selling honey and that hobby will pay itself off in the end. And compare that to golf. You take up golf, you're just going to have a big bill for the rest of your life where the bees, as long as you look after them, they will look after you in the end as well. And just make sure you push the bees in your marketing as much as yourself as well because the beekeeper, the bee farmer, is only one half of the business. The rest is the bees. You know, mm-hmm. there wouldn't be any honey without the bees. And uh, there wouldn't be any honey in the shop if it weren't for the bee farmer or the beekeeper. So it's very good, very important to get that good balance um, between farmer and seller. And, um, you know, whatever the bees need, uh, you tend, you look after your bees, you know, put them in a good solid hive, you know, get them nice and warm. The warmer the hive is, the more bees that are foraging, the more honey you're going to get. Um, it's just, you know, basic, simple husbandry. Um, get all the basic stuff right and you know literally show all that within your social media people want to see it and you'll come across good just by doing that oh lovely oh thank you and yourself wendy have you got any tips for people to not mark? really um I, I can't say much more than um the griff has actually you know oh, yeah. Well, yeah. sorry summed it up pretty well then I, mm. yes i think he has so uh you know i i'm a great believer in exactly exactly what he's saying really and selling yourself and um i mean i I haven't gone down the facebook route mine is really by going into shops i don't have uh, sufficient quantities and to do the sort of thing that griff's doing um so it is just a case of going into shops and um everybody wants local that's the thing now everybody wants local because it isn't just the fact that it's local in that sense it's also the fact that it's um there's less mileage involved mm. um, in getting the food to them sustainability uh, and yeah yeah so um yeah and just be personable and always be clean of course that's the other thing when anybody you know if you're selling then you've got to be clean and even when you're keeping bees you you need to make sure you're your bee suits clean your equipment's clean um it's you know it's not about being out delivering lambs <laughs> or uh milking cows or anything like that these days you know for for the beekeeper anyway that's it that's no, it. 
Okay. Well, thank you very much for joining us. That, that's it for this evening. Um, our next live event is on the 22nd of May, and I hope you can join us then at 8 o'clock. If you've got any questions for Griff, feel free to um, ask them on the Beecraft website, and I'm sure if we pass them along, he'll uh, he'll gladly offer a response. And, uh, we'll uh, see you on the 22nd of May. So bye from me. Bye from me.